Uh, the thickness of the crust is critical, the rotation period of the Earth, the gravitational interaction between the moon, strangely enough, has to be, is all these contribute to what makes life possible. And so they call that the anthropic principle, which collectively is an overwhelming argument for a designer. Scientists don't like to acknowledge that because a designer implies accountability. That the Earth was fine-tuned for the existence of life is no surprise to creation scientists. The Bible declared this fact thousands of years ago. In Isaiah, we read, For thus says the Lord, who created the heavens, who is God, who formed the earth and made it, who has established it, who did not create it in vain, who formed it to be inhabited. Physicist and Nobel laureate Arno Penzias stated in 1992, Astronomy leads us to a unique event, a universe which was created out of nothing, one with the very delicate balance needed to provide exactly the right conditions required to permit life, and one which has an underlying, one might say, supernatural plan. Astronomer George Greenstein stated in his book, The Symbiotic Universe, as we survey all the evidence, the thought insistently arises that some supernatural agency must be involved. Is it possible that suddenly, without intending to, we have stumbled upon scientific proof of the existence of a supreme being? Was it God who stepped in and so providentially crafted the cosmos for our benefit? The more we study the cosmos, the more the psalmist words ring true. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utters speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. For me to believe that all our life and our planets came from one big bang, I, I don't believe it. I believe, I believe there is a higher power out there. No, I do not believe that the universe has some sort of maker behind it. No, I believe the universe started with the Big Bang. I believe the Earth was designed for life because everything we see around us, everything we need to live, everything we need to survive and be happy is all around us. We don't, we don't want for anything, all our food, our air, everything to make us happy and to, for us to survive is here. So there had to be an originator of this. It couldn't just happen by, by chance. The evidence clearly reveals that God has created the universe and the solar system and specifically designed the Earth for life. Yet many would rather trust and believe in the Big Bang rather than trust and believe in the God of the Bible. In the next section, we'll examine the possibility of life arising from chemicals spontaneously. Did chemical evolution on the primordial Earth produce life? According to evolutionary thought, all life, bacteria, fish, plants, animals, and men, originated from chemical compounds. This theory that life arose from non-living chemicals is called spontaneous generation. One of the fundamental laws of uh, biology is the law of biogenesis, that life comes only from pre-existing life. And of course, for a creationist, that's certainly no surprise. Life, God's life, created life to multiply after its kind. So that makes sense to a creationist. But to an evolutionist, there was a time in the past when there wasn't any life. And so chemicals somehow got together and made living things. And, and this is, uh, was often called a spontaneous generation. And there have been some enormous problems faced in trying to get a group of chemicals to, to, to come to life. 
A few years ago, Stanley Miller did a, a famous experiment. He took some simple materials, uh, some methane, some ammonia, uh, some water vapor, uh, zots them with an electric spark to simulate lightning flashing back and forth in the atmosphere of the ancient Earth, and in just a week, he got amino acids, the building blocks of protein. And that was hailed as almost making life in a test tube. That was one I used when I used to teach evolution. But I took a look at the rest of the evidence. And there are three problems with that brilliant experiment. One, he had the wrong starting materials. Uh, two, he used the wrong conditions. And three, he got the wrong results. Other than that, it was a brilliant experiment. The Miller experiment assumed an atmosphere of methane and ammonia, gases that could not have been present in large amounts because the ammonia would be decomposed by ultraviolet light. And methane should be found stuck to ancient sedimentary clays, but is not. Miller also left out oxygen because he knew that oxygen would destroy the very molecules he was trying to produce. But as deep as we dig, we find oxidized rocks, suggesting an oxygen-rich atmosphere. The Earth did not have a reducing atmosphere, say an atmosphere of methane, ammonia, and hydrogen that was suggested in the Stanley Miller experiment. Uh, they never, the Earth never had such an atmosphere. The, Geology is now clear. There is good evidence that the Earth has always had oxygen in its atmosphere. Now that would absolutely preclude any evolutionary origin of life. Miller also used the wrong conditions. He used an electric spark to combine the gas molecules. The problem is that the same spark that puts amino acids together also tears them apart and it's much better at destroying them than making them. The problem was the, the chemicals put together, the amino acids in the flask, would also be torn apart by the very spark that put them together. Miller knew that as a biochemist, and so he circulated the gases, trapped out the molecules he wanted using a well-known biochemist trick, but that would be cheating because you were supposed to say this is how life arose before there was a, any intelligent design to preserve these molecules from that destructive force, wrong conditions. Then he got the wrong results. The main product of the Miller experiment was tar, a nuisance in organic reactions. Trace amounts of several amino acids that make up the proteins in living things were also produced. The problem is that Miller's experiment produced both left-handed and right-handed amino acids. Only left-handed amino acids make up the proteins of life, and just one right-handed molecule prevents their production. What Miller actually produced was a poisonous brew that would destroy any hope for the chemical evolution of life. You might say, well, if what I've just said is true, what about all the evolutionists that believe in this? Well, interestingly enough, the evolutionists would agree with me. Uh, there was a time I was at a debate at San Diego State University. I was just in the audience. But uh, two friends of mine, Dr. Henry Morris and Dr. Dwayne Gish, were doing the debate for the creationists. And at the end, uh, somebody in the audience noted, ladies and gentlemen, we're privileged this evening. We have in our audience Dr. Stanley Miller. And Gish had explained why Miller's experiment would not produce life from non-life. And so the, the person asked Dr. Miller, would you like to respond to what Dr. Gish said about your experiments for chemical evolution? And Dr. Miller said, no. <laughs> he hasn't believed in that for decades. He knows all of those same problems. I would say this, any theory on the origin of life on the Earth, or any other planet as far as that's concerned, is a fairy tale. Evolution teaches that energy, such as lightning or heat, plus matter, can occasionally create new life. Yet our entire food industry rests on the fact that this can never happen. If we examine a jar of peanut butter, it contains matter and is exposed to light and heat. But we never find new life inside unless an outside life contaminates it. If the theory of evolution was viable, then I should occasionally by subjecting this to energy, end up having new life. Now we go down to the store, and um, if, if I open this jar of peanut butter, maybe not often, but on some occasion, I should find new life inside. 
And so, when we open the jar of peanut butter, we look in there, there's no new life. <laughs> and, and, and aren't you glad, okay? Now, um, you may smile at this, but hopefully you'll never forget it because you and I conduct, uh, collectively, over a billion experiments every year, and we've done that for virtually a hundred years, and we never encounter